Theodore Dreiser. An American Tragedy. Kansas City, hot summer evening. Two adults and four children sing psalms and pass out religious pamphlets. The older boy clearly does not like what he is forced to do, but his parents are eager to save lost souls, which, however, brings them only moral satisfaction. ISA Griffiths, the father, is impractical, and the family can barely make ends meet. Young Clyde Griffiths seeks to escape this dreary world. He gets a job as an assistant soda vendor at a drugstore, and then as a delivery boy at the Green Davidson Hotel. The hotel job doesn't require any special skills and abilities, but it brings in good tips, which allows Clyde not only to contribute to the family budget, but also to buy himself nice clothes and save some money. His workmates quickly accept Clyde into their company, and he plunges headlong into a fun new existence. He meets a pretty salesgirl, Hortense Briggs, who, however, is not sensible for her age and is not going to favor anybody just for beautiful eyes. She really wants a fancy jacket that costs $115, and Clyde finds it hard to resist her desire. Soon Clyde and company go on a joyride in a luxury Packard. This car is taken without permission by one of the young men, Sparser, from the garage of the rich man his father serves. On the way back to Kansas City, the weather begins to turn bad, snow is falling, and we have to drive very slowly. Clyde and his companions are late for work at the hotel, so they ask Sparser to speed up. He does so, but he hesitates and runs over a girl and then fails to steer while evading pursuit. The driver and one of the girls are left lying unconscious in the wrecked car, while everyone else scatters. The next day, the newspapers report on the accident. The girl is dead, the arrested Sparser gives the names of all the other picnickers. Fearing arrest, Clyde and some of the other members of the company leave Kansas City. For three years Clyde lives away from home under a false name, doing dirty, thankless work and getting pennies for it. But one day in Chicago he meets his buddy Retherer, who was also with him in the Packard. Reeserer gets him a job at the Union Club as a delivery boy. Twenty-year-old Clyde is quite happy with his new life, but one day Samuel Griffiths, his uncle who lives in Lycourt, New York, and owns a collar factory, shows up at the club. A meeting of relatives results in Clyde moving to Lycourt. His uncle promises him a place at the factory, though he does not promise him the moon. Clyde's contacts with rich relatives seem more promising than a job at the Union Club, though he earns good money. Samuel's son Gilbert takes his cousin in without much joy and, convinced that he does not have any useful knowledge and skills, assigns him to a rather hard and low-paying job in a decontamination shop in the basement. Clyde rents a room in a cheap boarding house and starts, as they say, from scratch, hoping, however, to succeed sooner or later. A month goes by. Clyde faithfully does everything he is asked to do. Griffith Sr. asks his son what he thinks of Clyde, but Gilbert, who is wary of the arrival of a poor relative, is cool in his estimation. In his opinion, Clyde is unlikely to be promoted, he has no education, he is not committed enough, and he is too soft. Samuel, however, likes Clyde and is willing to give his nephew a chance to prove himself. Against Gilbert's wishes, Clyde is invited to the house for a family dinner. There he meets not only his kinsman's family, but also the charming representatives of the Lycurgian Beaumont, young Bertina Cranston and Sandra Finchley, who are quite attracted to the handsome and well-mannered young man. Finally, at his father's insistence, Gilbert finds a less demanding and more prestigious job for Clyde, he becomes an accountant. Gilbert warns him, however, that he must observe decorum in his relations with the female workers and that all sorts of liberties will be firmly suppressed. Clyde is willing to follow his employer's orders and, despite the attempts of some of the girls to make love to him, he remains deaf to their flirtations. Finally, at his father's insistence, Gilbert finds a less demanding and more prestigious job for Clyde, he becomes an accountant. Gilbert warns him, however, that he must observe decorum in his relations with the female workers and that all sorts of liberties will be firmly suppressed. Clyde is willing to follow his employer's orders and, despite the attempts of some of the girls to make love to him, he remains deaf to their flirtations. Soon, however, the factory receives an additional order for callers, and this, in turn, requires an expansion of the staff. Young Roberta Alden joins the factory, whose charms Clyde cannot easily resist. 
They begin to meet, Clyde's advances become more and more insistent, and it becomes more and more difficult for Roberta, who was brought up in strict rules, to remember her girlish prudence. Meanwhile, Clyde meets Sandra Finchley again, and this meeting abruptly changes his life. A wealthy heiress, a representative of the local moneyed aristocracy, Sandra shows genuine interest in the young man and invites him to an evening of dancing, where the Lycurgian golden youth gather. Under the onslaught of new experiences, Roberta's modest charm begins to pale in Clyde's eyes. The girl feels that Clyde is no longer so attentive to her, she is afraid of losing his love, and one day she gives in to temptation. Roberta and Clyde become lovers. Sandra Finchley, however, does not disappear from his life. On the contrary, she brings Clyde into her circle, and enticing prospects turn his head. This does not go unnoticed by Roberta, and she suffers grievous pangs of jealousy. To top it all off, she discovers that she is pregnant. She admits this to Clyde, and he feverishly tries to find a way out of the situation. But medication does not bring the desired result, and the doctor, whom they find with such difficulty, categorically refuses to perform an abortion. The only way out, to get married, does not suit Clyde. After all, it means that he will have to give up his dreams of a brilliant future, which the relationship with Sandra has instilled in him. Roberta is desperate. She is willing to go to the lengths of telling Clyde's uncle what happened. This would mean the end of his career and an end to his romance with Sandra, but he is indecisive, hoping to work something out. He promises Roberta either to find a doctor or, if one is not found in two weeks, to marry her, even formally, and to support her for a while until she can work. But then Clyde comes across an article in the newspaper about a tragedy at Lake Pass, a man and a woman took a boat for a ride, but the next day the boat was found upside down, later the body of the girl was found, but the man could not be found. This story makes a strong impression on him, especially when he receives a letter from Roberta, who has gone to her parents, she does not intend to wait any longer and promises to return to Lykerg and tell everything to Griffith Sr. Clyde realizes he is running out of time and must make a decision. Clyde invites Roberta to take a trip to Great Otter Lake, promising to marry her afterwards. So, a seemingly terrible decision is made, but he himself does not believe that he will find the strength to carry out what he has planned. It is one thing to commit a murder in his imagination and quite another to do it in reality. So Clyde and Roberta go for a boat ride on a deserted lake. Clyde's gloomy, brooding look startles Roberta, and she cautiously approaches him, asking what happened to him. But when she tries to touch him, he, unaware of himself, hits her with the camera and pushes her so that she loses her balance and falls over. The boat flips over and its side hits Robert in the head. She begs Clyde to help her, to keep her from drowning, but he does nothing. What more than once he has thought of, has happened. He makes it ashore alone, without Roberta. But both the upturned boat and Roberta's body are quickly found. Investigator Haight and Prosecutor Mason vigorously take up the case and soon get to Clyde. He at first locks himself in, but the experienced prosecutor has no trouble cornering him. Clyde is arrested, now his fate will be decided in court. Samuel Griffiths, of course, is shocked by what has happened, nevertheless he hires good lawyers. They fight as hard as they can, but Mason knows his business, too. The long and tense trial ends with a death sentence. Wealthy relatives stop helping Clyde, and only his mother tries to do something for him. Clyde is transferred to Auburn Prison, called the House of Death. The mother's desperate attempts to find money to continue the fight for her son's life are unsuccessful. Society has lost interest in the condemned man, and nothing will now prevent the machinery of justice from seeing the case through.